In the 10th century, the Parsi people had just migrated to India from Persia, modern-day Iran, to escape religious persecution. Their religion is called Zoroastrianism, an ancient religious practice focusing on the dualistic struggle humans make between good and evil. When the Parsis arrived in India, one of the things they were looking for was a place to lay their dead to rest. In the modern-day U.S., an appropriate place to lay a loved one to rest might be in a cemetery, or to have them cremated. But the Zoroastrians have some very specific beliefs about what happens to a person when they die, which limits their options. The belief they hold is that as soon as a person dies, their body becomes tainted with evil, and must be dealt with in a way which does not allow that evil to corrupt any of the three sacred elements, water, earth, and fire. This excludes burial and cremation as options. So the Parsi practice something which has been called sky burial. This is setting the corpse in a place where the creatures of the sky can return the body to nature. To start, the Parsis began creating Dungurvadis, which were cultivated forests meant to be sacred spaces. Deep in the heart of these Dungurvadis, Dakmas were created, large stone structures meant to be sacred sky burial sites. These structures are about 100 feet wide, circular, 50 feet tallish, and roofless. There is a ramp leading up to the outer wall, and on the inside there is a wide, open space, reminiscent of an amphitheater. There are spaces marked in the floor of the open area going all the way around the inner diameter, different spots for different bodies, men in the outermost spaces, women in the middle, and children go in the ring of spaces closest to the center. In the very middle, there is a wide, deep space, a well of sorts, where the bones of the deceased will be placed after the process has been completed. When the British first came to India and started seeing these large dakmas here and there, they thought they deserved a name that was solemn and had weight to it, so they called them the Towers of Silence. These towers are incredibly sacred spaces. The only people who have been allowed inside them for thousands of years are the Khandiya, the pallbearers of the Dungravadis. In Mumbai, India, there are five dakmas. When things were going well, these five towers could handle around 1,000 deceased Parsis throughout a single year. The entirety of this sacred practice is made possible by one thing, the vulture. For thousands of years, the vulture has played an incredibly key role in allowing this system to function with incredible efficiency and regularity. The Indian gyps vulture is a massive bird, often having a wingspan of up to 8 feet. Up through the 1970s, they were so common and plentiful in India that no one had ever even attempted to count them. The estimated number of past vultures in India was around 40 million. With the belief in India that cows are sacred, livestock are always left to expire naturally, and the vultures served as a natural cleanup crew. It was not uncommon for a recently deceased cow to be reduced to nothing more than a pile of bones in minutes by a group of vultures looking for dinner. Vultures are not picky and will eat literally every part of a dead creature, human and animal alike. This is the reason that this form of burial has worked effectively for thousands of years. The corpse bearers lay the body in its place in the Tower of Silence, and as they do, hundreds of vultures gather round and watch. As soon as the bearers back away, the deceased is descended on by a large number of vultures who very quickly turn a human corpse into a pile of clean, meatless bones hair, internal organs, skin, eyes, there is nothing edible left. The Khandiya then collect the bones and deposit them into the central well where they can continue their decomposition process in peace. Since the Parsis first came to India, the average has been around three bodies per day laid to rest in this manner. Throughout the ages, there were wars, famines, plagues, huge amounts of modernization and cultural upheaval. Yet through it all, this practice that was steeped in tradition remained, constant, unchanging. It is for that reason that the 1980s came as such a great shock. People started to notice that where there used to be hundreds of vultures, there were now only a few dozen. In time, the vultures are reduced to a scant handful around the edges, and finally, no vultures at all. The pallbearers began to notice that what used to take minutes is now taking entire days. Bodies that were placed out the previous day are still there, 
Even bodies that were placed a week ago are not gone. Not just human bodies either. Livestock have begun to clutter up fields. Dead and bloated bodies that once would have been removed in a short time are just sitting there, rotting. People begin to notice. In 2003, it is discovered that the vultures are being indirectly poisoned, a poison that causes kidney failure. The culprit? A common pain management drug very similar to aspirin or ibuprofen called diclofenac, very commonly used to treat things like arthritis. People with this drug in their system are eaten by the vultures when they die. More importantly, in 1990, this drug had been introduced to the veterinary world and became a common painkiller for vets to use on cattle. There are a lot of cows in India. This drug is very cheap and very popular. The vultures are dying by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, until there are almost no vultures left at all. Attempts are currently being made to keep the few that are still alive safe in captivity, but it's difficult. They can't eat any animal with a diclofenac in their system. Also, they only lay about one egg a year, and they are notoriously difficult to breed in captivity. The cruel irony of this twist of fate is that the vultures have incredibly resilient stomachs. They have been known to eat things with tuberculosis, rabies, and even anthrax with no effect to their own health. By the early 2000s, 98% of all the vultures are gone. The drug diclofenac was banned in India in 2003, but that is much easier said than done, and in later years it was found that it was not the only drug that was deadly to the vulture. Back in the Towers of Silence, the smaller birds of prey begin to come and take advantage, the hawks and kites and owls. But these smaller birds aren't as indiscriminate. They don't gorge themselves on entire bodies. They go for the small, fleshy bits, eyes and ears and noses. The pallbearers are forced to walk around rotting, decomposing bodies with missing fingers and eyes like their own personal daily horror show. The people living in the high-rise apartments at the edge of the Dungar bodies can see the decomposing corpses and even start to complain about the stench. The question that is forefront in everyone's minds is, what do we do now that the vultures are gone? How can we help the bodies decompose faster? There are many options that are considered, and even a few that are tried. Freezing, chemicals, insects. The forbidding of the three sacred objects coming into contact with the deceased makes the process even more difficult. How do you get rid of a body without using fire, earth, or water? Eventually, the option of setting up some solar mirror arrays is landed upon. The mirrors will reflect the light of the sun onto the bodies and melt them. This is obviously not a perfect remedy and sparks backlash in the Parsi community as it feels like a backdoor kind of cremation. But the complaints were half-hearted as any option that had any effect and provided some relief was better than nothing. In 2005, the Parsis had to make a difficult choice. A woman named Don Baria stoked the public into seriously rethinking the way things were done when she learned that her own mother had been left on top of one of the towers for more than a year. Never before seen images were shown of loved ones in various stages of decomposition, missing eyes and other appendages. Many took the controversial road to relief by simply having their loved ones cremated rather than suffered through the once sacred tradition now broken. There have been other attempts at finding ways to bring the vulture numbers back including teaching them to only eat from specific food source locations and turning each tower of silence into its own aviary. But all of these options have failed to get off the ground. The few who still have hope for the return of the vultures are holding out for the ones being raised in conservatories. Right now, they are playing the long game. I guess we'll just have to wait and see.